Hello and welcome to another edition of the Arena Craft Podcast, a show focused exclusively on Magic the Gathering Arena. My name is Arjuna. I am the host who doesn't get introduced that much. It's fine. I enjoy doing the introduction. And with us on his very own podcast, the king of magic YouTube, (laughs) the one in best of one, the person who makes it all happen on the Arena Craft Podcast and really dictates most of the arena matter outside <laughs> of the World Championship. It's Kova Go Blue. How are you doing today, buddy? Hi, I'm good. <laughs> Everybody, that's Arjuna. Do you feel introduced now? I've, oh, I'm solidly introduced, man. <laughs> hey, you know, I, I just get to do all the talking, which is what I'm going to do today. Kova Go Blue has already had quite a long day. And uh, he has actually been hosting day one of the World's Championship Watch Party, which is exactly what we're going to talk about today. So um, strap yourselves in crafties. You're going to hear a lot of Arjuna flapping his gums over here. And a little of me barely squeaking out (laughs) words as my voice continues to fall off a cliff. But how could you skip? We couldn't skip a week with worlds happening. Worlds, dude. Oh, man. We haven't had worlds in so long. Yeah, uh, yeah, an entire year to be precise. And uh, this one feels big, man. I, okay, so it's big for a number of reasons, right? One of the things that has made it kind of big is this, I would say, like semi scandal, right? Leading up to this particular one in the form of deck list leaks. Wow. And this is this is kind of a big deal actually. It's kind of a big deal for this championship because okay, not only is it like one of the highest EV events of the year for all the people playing in it, but it's a pretty small field, right? 16 players playing in this tournament. And so the kind of information and the deck list leaks coming out basically a week ahead of time it just gives a massive edge to all of the competitors. Fortunately, it is a somewhat symmetrical edge just in terms of the advantage opportunity that they got out of it. But it may just of like, just based on the metagame breakdown and such, it is a leak which may have disproportionately advantaged some players over the others. So that's kind of one interesting thing coming into this tournament. I know uh, Gabriel Nassif actually made a tweet something to the effect of can we have a gentleman's agreement that nobody practices in this week ahead of the championship, which I don't know if he was going to get full buy-in on that. I don't think he did, but uh, what what do you think about that CGB? I think that's asking a lot. Yeah. I dude that that's so rough. I I mean, it's also Gabriel Nassif. So he, he can walk this line between like trolling and, sincere he he can yeah. you know somehow he can do both i i can't get away with both i have to pretty much troll and and, and then if i'm going to be sincere make it a full on thing but he he somehow can do both so i'm not exactly sure where he was on that um yeah i i'm sure that he would most of the competitors would love to have a week off to just focus and kind of zone in and not worry so much but as soon as i i know that as soon as that leak happened they felt like well I guess I better test. Everybody else could be testing. You're not going to be want the person who, you know, doesn't test. So it, yeah. it just puts, it puts them in a terrible spot. And as a reminder, like there's money on the line. First prize is $70,000. Mm-hmm. Yes, indeed. Now I actually think, I don't necessarily think that this was a particular catalyzing factor for Gabe putting it out there, but I will say that I do think that he and his team of four players, a quarter of the field, by the way, was disproportionately disadvantaged for the league. And that is because they are running a very unconventional deck list, which we will get to soon. I think that had this deck list been unknown going into the tournament, I think it would have had even more of an edge than it perhaps has uh, being a very, very cool deck list. I think so, and a very kind of outside of the box deck list, um, a new take on an archetype, which we're all quite familiar with. And so um, I just, I thought that that was particularly interesting. I kind of wonder how much percentage their team actually lost for kind of the cat getting let out of the bag there. It's always assumed that 
it's more damaging to rogue. And I do mean the, uh, I, I don't mean rogue the tribe. <laughs> hate yep. that i have to clarify that all the time but it's uh more it, it's more brutal to the rogue strategies it's more damaging to the rogue strategies for deck lists to get leaked and the main yep. reason is because of sideboard plans so everybody out there can say everybody has access to these lists it's an open deck list tournament it was going to be anyway but now you have a week to come up with how to sideboard against these decks and figure out how those decks will sideboard against you. And that kind of thing yep. is not always evident at first glance. That's the kind of thing that when you don't have practice with that or you're not prepared for it or you haven't had much time to think about it, that's the kind of thing that in a tournament does get you equity. And that equity is lost when the decks are out early. So uh, yep. damaging, I think, to, the, to Team Grixis, of which there are four out of 16, 25% of the field, damaging to the blue white tempo list which is probably the spiciest mm -hmm. list in the field i think because mm -hmm. that one is not easy to play against and yeah that's my take on it yeah exactly so um it is a bit of a shame overall it also just i mean think about how sweet it would have been to like you know, wake up on Friday morning and to get the whole thing fired up and to discover like, oh my gosh, you know, look at these rogue lists. I mean, it just, I don't know. Anyway, it, it, it kind of, it was kind of a bummer. I think overall that it happened, but here we are. Magic is, is nothing if not kind of a bummer sometimes. And uh, we'll still manage to wring whatever excitement we can out of this here. So let's jump into the meta game breakdown. Now, as we said, we have a quarter of the field playing this this rogue new version of this uh, turns list, basically the is it turns list, um, Gabe and team saw fit to add black to their list. And we'll definitely go into why that is a little bit later. So Grixis Epiphany coming in at a quarter of the field with four decks. Uh, next of all, we have our next four decks playing Alrin's Epiphany. And not only Alrin's Epiphany, but the galvanic Alrin's combo in the form of is it epiphany now this okay so this is a different i think version of the list than you will have seen predominantly on the ladder but the core idea of the list is similar it's just going pretty hard on trying to control the game and then taking all of the turns with the galvanic alarins combo so um this list not not so surprising i think we all expected some version of it to show up and we have a quarter of the field playing, you know, roughly the same version of the list. I haven't cross-referenced exactly to see what the differences might be in the list. Sure. I, I, I have. Um, I'll add an okay. asterisk there because three of them are playing almost the same list. Uh, okay. And we're going to get to the unexpected windfall stuff going on there. Oh, um, yeah. So three players definitely tested together and are on almost the same is it turns list. One player is playing a version with like a whole bunch of one ofs. I, I I just call it singleton is it like there's a ton of one ofs in this uh one of these lists. And then uh, there's also I think you were gonna get to it, but there's also one person mm -hmm. playing good old gold span dragon is it dragons. Yep. Yep, exactly. So this this list has the eggs and the dragons, and it's definitely more of a kind of smash face and bring the fight to the opponent kind of a list. Also stuff that you will have been fairly familiar if you've been playing on the ladder. Um, another list you'll be quite familiar with here is Mono Green Aggro, of which we have three decks, so almost 19% of the field. To the surprise of nobody, I think that everyone assumed there was going to be some amount of mono green aggro coming into this tournament. I think that I would say most people were probably genuinely surprised to see so few copies of this deck. Um, I think that I would have expected it to be at least 25% of the meta game. And a so, good reason for that is that the data from last weekend for competitive play showed mono green was by far the winningest deck at a 59.8% win rate in competitive play with it's yeah. only bad matchup being mono white. So uh, expected a lot of green got just a kind of a dash of green. Yep. Just a dash of green. Interestingly, some of the most formidable people in the field have chosen mono green, including uh, last time world champion, Paulo Vitor Damodarosa and another world champion, Seth Manfield, um, who I don't remember when he won it, but, you know, it's it's in living memory. Um, it was Abzan. He definitely played that was Abzan, Abzan, Cons of Tarkir. Yeah. 
a standard. Yep. yep. So, um, so anyway, so two, two reigning world champions on mono green, clearly the list can do work. Um, also, you know, both of those players, notable kind of like control and mid range players. So if they're both playing the deck, they must have thought that it had a good chance in the event. Um, and then we do have a couple copies of mono white aggro. This was a, if you'll remember last week, this was kind of a question mark. We left, uh, after our conversation with Michael J. Flores, shout out to Michael, by the way, a lot of people love that episode. It was great to have him on the show. Um, so we, we were all kind of wondering that if mono white sh would show up and it did two decks. So one eighth of the field playing mono white aggro. I think these lists are really sweet. So I'm looking forward to getting into those. They, they are playing, um, you know, not to toot my own horn or anything, but playing some cards that I would have put in my deck if I were building mono white for the field. So I, I felt kind of vindicated seeing some of the choices that were made there. And then a uh, couple, couple of rogue deck lists we haven't uh, spoken about here. We have a Gruel Aggro list played by John Emmanuel Dupra. Um, you know, J.E. Dupra never won to follow along the party line, as it were, usually likes to bring his own spice to an event. So it'll be really interesting to see how he ends up doing. A uh, very creative player and absolute beast of a magic player. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's called Moist Gruel. See moist it. Gruel. Okay. Moist. There we go. People love it <laughs> hearing the word moist. It makes them feel oh, oh don't they something. <laughs> oh, don't they? Well, I'll let you fill that in with your own minds that crafty is the imagination is a powerful thing. Uh, and <laughs> finally, finally, yes, this Azorius tempo list, um, played by Noriyuki Mori, who um Noriyuki is something of a sensation in the competitive magic world kind of exploded onto the scene out of basically nowhere in the last couple of years. Um, managed to, I'm trying to remember what, what he did in order to qualify for this. He won some, some event, right? I would guess it's the challenger gauntlet. Cause I don't remember yeah, him from right. being in rivals and the challenger gauntlet, the people who get invited are the top performers who are not in rivals or MPL, which yeah. I don't even know how to figure out who they are. So I haven't mm -hmm. been following that very closely this year. I think everybody knows that system was confusing, which is why this is like the last year of it. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, he, I believe he won probably the hardest tournament in the world to win, at least as far as like, how do you get into it? Nobody knows. How do you qualify for it? Nobody knows. You grind your head on a wall until something good happens. And that would be the challenger gauntlet. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. So just an absolute beast of a magic player. Also, I believe was responsible for that spicy is it control deck. Yep. Uh playing uh Kiara Vest the Sea God. So it's basically probably the only competitive deck in standard running Kiara Vest the Sea God, which uh wasn't an ultimatum deck. Uh-huh. Um, so pretty, pretty cool stuff overall from Noriyuki Mori. So continuing to deliver on the spicy brews will be very, very interested to see how Noriyuki ends up doing so that is the meta game rundown and i don't know cgb i figure do you want to just spend the episode reading over the lists and just discussing the meta game all right, right we're getting yeah. two thumbs up yeah yep okay awesome so um i don't know man okay let's start let's start with the predictable Okay. Um, I feel like let's just get them out of the way, honestly, because I want to spend most of my time talking about the interesting lists. I'm so proud so, of you as a YouTuber now. This is what we call milking the watch time. Keep it. <laughs> let's go. Good choice. Let's go. Good choice. Okay. So so don't worry, crafties. We'll 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 get into it. We'll get into the meat of it. But first, mono green aggro. Um, I would say not a great lot of variety variation between these lists um there are several differences i don't really feel like going super deep on the differences so let's start off by reading paulo vitor damo de rosa's version of mono green aggro God, by the I way wonder, why did you want to start here why on earth i wonder <laughs> why why would, why would we start here <laughs> you know side note i've seen an awful lot of people giving paulo shade for selecting this deck for the tournament 
like people being like, oh, I'm kind of surprised. I've lost a little bit of respect for Polo. I never thought that he'd choose this list, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, to all of those haters, I want to say, okay, well, A of all, at the end of day one, <laughs> he's what? Second place, right? I think he's second place in the tournament or maybe tied for second. He's doing well. Yeah. So he's he's kicking plenty of ass playing this list. And um, and I mean, come on, man. Like, he's better than you. Whoever you are criticizing <laughs> Polo, he's better than you. All right. So cool it. Cool your jets. All right. Let's get into it. Was so, that the um, all? Was that the B of all? He's better than <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, B, B of all, he's better than you. B C stands of all, for better. Cool it. <laughs> C stands for cool it. <laughs> <laughs> D of all you're dumb all right all right little little hard love from uh, from the harsh mentor over here all right so so let's let's read down his list so uh four old growth trolls to the surprise of nobody four kazandu mammoths one uno uno singular beautiful copy of a, of a little known card called primal Adversary. See, <laughs> CGB takes out his headphones. He's he's gonna go and get some bubble gum. I, I'm sorry, what? I, that, you cut out there. <laughs> CGB is gonna take a walk around the block while we discuss this next thing here. One copy of Primal Adversary, uh, two tangled Florahedrons, four werewolf pack leaders, and four sculptors of winter, which is not a card that we've seen a great deal showing up in these lists so that's that's pretty interesting running two single solitary copies i guess they're not solitary two but two not very many copies of ren and seven we've also got four blizzard brawls four asika's chariot four ranger classes three inscriptions of abundance and one snakeskin veil so um those those numbers of Blizzard Brawls, Inscriptions, Snakeskin Veils, definitely a carefully curated decision there about like which non-threat cards that you want to play in your deck. Um, and then, of course, we've got 19 Snow-Covered Forests and the full four Faceless Havens. So anyway, I think that um, a lot of this list looks kind of fairly stock to me, especially in the Creature Suite. I think... The, the big standouts for me are the Primal Adversary. It's an interesting choice there. Uh, and also the Four Sculptors of Winter. Why? I don't know, CGB. Why do you think that he may have chosen to select the Sculptor here? At first, when I saw Sculptor of Winter in a lot of these decks, I thought it was because of the difficulty you sometimes have activating a Blizzard Brawl if you miss a land yeah. drop. And yep. Sculptor of Winter is a snow permanent. So it counts towards that three number for your brawl. But this deck has all snow land, unless, of course, you're using your Mammoth or your Tangled Florahedron as a land. There are no layers of yeah. the Hydra, which is pretty surprising to a lot of people and four Faceless Havens. So the main thing that I've noticed about Sculptor of Winter is the mana explosion it can create if you have a troll on your mm. land. It, That's pretty devious. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's pretty sneaky, and much like Lotus Cobra, it's a 2-2 two -two that can be used for mana, and it's another 2-drop. But yeah, th there's something about that thing with the troll that just comes up more than you think it should, and I think makes the card a little bit better. Yeah, another thing just to note is even if you're not going to like get the full 4 mana out of that, land in a turn cycle it also lets you tap it for two mana and then untap it so that you can sack it to make the troll as well so uh yeah definitely a lot of a lot of cool stuff that you can do there for sure um so very interesting and it's also interesting to see it chosen over the lotus cobra which i know is a you know a card that's been also vying for that slot a card that i've been fairly down on i would say um outside of basically the uh, omnath deck but um, just a couple things to note about Lotus Cobra in the format. One of the nice things about it is that it generates mana without tapping. And so that can actually give you more options. Like let's say you want to crew in a Seeker's Chariot or you even want to turn the thing sideways. It does have two power after all, which is kind of nice. Um, and in a field like this, for example, the Lotus Cobra, it wouldn't fall prey to many things your other mana docs might 
except for maybe some splash damage off of the freaking um the the red dual spike land field spike hazard. field hazard yeah yeah exactly so that that is a card that would hit the cobra um which a lot of these is it lists have been playing in some numbers um to go after the hermit so uh anyway yeah definitely this list it's very very clear that every single slot in the list has been considered and carefully picked over and curated um i don't know cgb do you, are there any other revelations that are kind of jumping out to you looking at paulo's list here 29 land uh potentially of, of course land. we're we're counting kazandu mammoth and two tangle florahedron but you shouldn't have to miss a land drop with this deck unless you chose to which i i often wondered how the dfcs would play out um when they were introduced in the Zendikar Rising. And for the most part, what we saw is just them complementing adventures because adventures were doing all the heavy lifting in Eldraine Standard. But now we see that they're a pretty important feature of these standard decks since then. You just never want to miss land. And this isn't mm -hmm. the only deck running about 29 lands, including DFCs. There's also some sideboardy stuff. Oh, I was going to say Lotus Cobra is also great with unnatural growth because you don't have to tap mm. it for mana and it it's a four power attacker, but there's no unnatural yeah. growth in this list. Um, so that's yeah. a big deal. No, that is a big deal, especially since it is a card that people have been choosing more and more lately. And I believe some of the other versions in this tournament are running it. Um, so yeah, that is, that's an interesting choice for sure. A um, couple of pretty spicy cards in the side body here. One of them choose your weapon is I mean, this is like this is like the draftiest of draft chaff, right? You want to tell um, them what it does? <laughs> yeah. So two and a green instant. Choose one. Uh, double target creature's power and toughness until end of turn. So you get a little bit of that unnatural growth going on. Or the other version is the spell deals five damage to target creature with flying. So, I mean, there is quite a lot of relevant text here for the field, I would say. Being able to kill a gold spend dragon, of course, is very nice. Um, but yeah, we've already seen this card uh, clutch at least one game in the championship. Uh, people are calling it Ember Cleave at home. <laughs> so it did clutch that game brutally, though. Um, the, yeah. Uh, for those who haven't watched it, or, or no, they by the time this comes out, you've either watched it or you haven't. So uh, yeah, but, exactly. Uh, the first game is in the books, and two rounds of standard are in the books. So we haven't seen these decks play out much. But something we did see was Mori's blue white tempo deck, which we'll get to in a position. Mm to make blocks in such a way that he could probably win the game in a couple turns or block in such a way that he could win the game the next turn, but lose to yeah. the one and only copy of choose your weapon in the 75. And of course, yeah. a uh, Sam party, the other play person running this exact 75 had choose your weapon. Yeah. It was the perfect had it moment. Yep. And uh, there's been a number of those actually in the tournament so far. Um, just going to show that the ultimate esports skill is top decking. It is. <laughs> so final thing to note, cards like Choose Your Weapon become better when you have Trample threats in your deck. And uh, Trample just being a very important keyword in standard right now, specifically for a number of reasons, both in this field and off. If you ever want, again, want to win against cards like uh, Lolth, for example, Trample is very important. And we actually see Paulo's list have three copies of Frog Hemoth in the sideboard. So actually not a Frog Mimoth in this championship, as I, <laughs> as I had perhaps suggested it might be in the past. Um, okay, so let's keep going here. And let's talk about Seth Manfield's version. Now, um, Seth Manfield's version looks somewhat similar to Paulo's, except instead of the elves, he's running four Lotus Cobras. So like we talked about. And instead of the Primal Adversary, he's chosen to run Briarbridge Tracker. He's also got three Renan Sevens instead of two. He's main decking one copy of Unnatural Growth, which is quite interesting. And to make room for all of that stuff, he's only got two Inscriptions of Abundance and no main deck Snakeskin Veils in his list. So um, this is like a slightly bigger, I would say. It's like he looked at Polo's list or maybe didn't. But if you look at Polo's list and you compare with this one, he's just like getting a little thicker, a little chunkier 
here. And, uh, you know, man, sometimes that unnatural growth just comes down and ends the game on the spot. Um, I don't see him running any more of those in the sideboard. He's, he does have, now, this is interesting. He chose to do a two and two split in his list of lands with Lair of the Hydra and Faceless Haven. So he's hedging a little more away from that scenario where, you know, you draw too many Havens in the early game and you can't play all of your double and triple green spells on time. Um, another thing I noticed about his sideboard is that he's got three, count them, three Toski Bearers of yeah. Secrets. He's the only Acorn Gamer. Yeah, which is, I mean, that's a statement, man. I mean, is do you think he he must be just intending to bring those in against all of these is it lists, right? It stuns me because of fade, fading hope and divide by zero are like the blue cards yeah. of the format, and we'll get to where they're getting played, but they are in all these lists, and yep. it just seems so good against Toski. Yep, exactly. So yeah, I'm a little bit surprised to see that myself. Um, another thing I'm just surprised by is that I feel like you don't usually beat those lists through card advantage. You usually beat those lists through smacking their face into the pavement. And a, a four mana one powered creature is just really not doing much for you there. Yeah, so. so I'm wondering if it's for something else that we don't really understand. You know, that's true. Maybe he anticipated a different field right? Mm -hmm. Maybe he thought that he'd be playing against like some Azorius or even Demir control decks or something, which just didn't end up showing up. So yeah, that's really interesting. He's also got a very spicy one of a Shire soul of the wild in the sideboard, which I mean, I don't know, plays around divide by zero. Oh, does it? I'm trying to remember if divide it hits it or it not. It does. Okay. So it plays around the or, field. It has to if make it's it on the, the field. field. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So that's kind of interesting. Also, actually, um, maybe was a sideboard tech against these is it lists running the freaking cyclone summoner in their sideboard, right? That is pretty nice. Yeah. So if if you manage to pull that one off, that is five head, man. I mean, cyclone summoner looks so bad when none of your opponents bounce back to the hand. If you're thinking that nobody does that, I've never played against is it with cyclone summoner in the board. It's in this tournament. Like it, yes. it was a it was a thing that another team found to combat mono green. Three copies, to be precise. You know what so. else is in these decks? Mm. Field of Ruin. <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. I don't know if people realize, but Ashaya turns all your creatures into lands, but they're non-basic <laughs> lands. And I I had I've had some wonderful moments on the ladder where my opponent played an Ashaya and then like they they like attacked me with something and I had a field of ruin on the table and a field of ruin oh. in my hand. And I just oh. field of ruin their creature, untap, field of ruin their Ashaya. Oh, it burns. It burns. These yeah. things come up, man. Ashaya, <laughs> when as soon as Ashaya hits the battlefield, it's a different game of magic you're playing. So pretty cool to see its inclusion here. Yeah. Um Okay, sweet. And then we'll just take a, a quick glance at Sam Pardee's list. Uh, looks like Sam is running the Paulo version of the list. Um, they probably, yeah, they probably tested together. Yep, they also had so, help from LSV and uh, some of other friends of uh, of um, LSVs as well. Okay, there you go. So that's mono green. Um, let's pivot over to mono white aggro. And um, the uh, like I said before, I think these lists are really, really sweet. So let's look at Ray Sato's list here. Um, the creature suite, the deck's mostly creatures, of course. Four Elite Spellbinder, three Redain, which I think is just such a smart split right now. Um, that's one of the first things that I would do if I was building a mono white list is make sure that I was running, you know, a lot of copies of those cards because uh, they're just very, very important against the field right now. Um, they're just pretty backbreaking against cards like Oleron's Epiphany, cards like Memory Deluge. Sometimes you can snatch a sweeper out of your opponent's hand. You know, uh, burning down the house looks pretty terrible at seven mana. Chariot, so definitely seven. Yep. Yeah, it's just a great card, right? I mean, just a great card. You can make your mono green opponent have to spend their whole turn to Blizzard Brawl you, stuff like that. So Anyway, just uh, really, really good stuff. Also, we saw a fair amount of Redain today, just like slowing down these mono green decks, right? Basically forcing them to play off curve. 
um, it, it comes up. It comes up. So anyway, just a big fan of those cards for sure. Um, now we've we've decided in the new standard that sorry, code spell cleric just wasn't quite getting there in the new meta, and so uh, it has been replaced by Stonebinders Familiar. This is a card which we saw looking pretty bad today, but that was just variants. Um, card you know can get very big very quickly. It's kind of doing the uh, pelt collector impression in this deck. Pretty solid card overall. Also, four copies of Usher of the Fallen, the actual best one drop. Four copies of Sun Gold Sentinel, which, you know, I was high on this card coming into the set. Really glad to see it seeing play here. This card's very, very important for a number of reasons. Uh, but one of the biggest ones is that these Is It lists, and particularly these Brixis lists, are very, very graveyard centric. And so being able to just tag whether it's your opponent's, uh, you know, Galvanic iteration memory deluge or even just you know a key removal spell that you don't want to get cast later on by leah is is pretty sweet and then of course the ability to get that coven ability hex proof unblockable by alarin's epiphany birds and stuff like that the card's just very versatile so really glad to see that one showing also up. grows your stone binders familiar yes that's a really really good point yep so yeah this card has a lot of sweet synergies um really solid little two drop uh, for Luminarch Aspirants, don't leave home without them, as Michael J. Flores learned. Uh, three Adeline Resplendent Cathar, a card which you were pretty high on CGB. This card's been doing a lot of work in the new standard. And uh, I think something that I missed and maybe a lot of people had missed is that Adeline doesn't even need to get in for you to get that 1-1 one, one out of it. Yep. As long as any creature of yours attacks, uh, Adeline gets you another 1-1 one, one attacker. The Vigilance is really good. I didn't have this in my build of Mono White that I made a video with, but I would have if I got there because Adeline plus Maul is kind of a one-two punch and we're coming up on that. Yep, exactly. So, and then uh, finally, four copies of Intrepid Adversary, just super solid card. It makes your, your go wide cards like Usher of the Fallen and Adeline especially good if you're pooping out a bunch of tokens, especially since these cards, these lists are moving away from the, um, from the Spirit Maker. Uh, what's that called? Clarion Spirit. Clarion Spirit, right, mm -hmm. exactly. So they're moving, these lists are moving away from that, just play a bunch of creatures in one turn, make a bunch of spirits thing, but still got the token thing going on. So overall, I think this creature suite is really, really cool. Um, just very well-built little group of creatures there. And then we have two portable holes, two malls of the Skyclaves, uh, which, yeah, CGB highlighted there, and three fateful absences. Um, so that's, of course, in the main deck to take care of cards like Goldspan Dragon and uh, Mono Green, of course, being a big th expected threat. And even cards like Leer, um, which, you know, it seldom works against Leer, but it's nice to have it as an option against that. So, and then of course, four Faceless Haven, one Cave of the Frost Dragon and 19 Snow Covered Plains. So I think that this list looks really tight. Um, I feel like this list has game against most decks in the format um you can just curve out so nicely with this and beat face and the deck's surprisingly resilient you know you can you can clutch out games with this deck that you wouldn't have thought you you could so i think if you want to play mono white i would have no reservation whatsoever about crafting this up and hitting the ladder um i think all of the rares in this list are really solid cards and they're probably going to see a lot of play I played mono white for today's video for YouTube. Nice. I the it will be out by the time that people hear this. I played nine games. I was on the draw seven times. Oof. Predict my record. Guess what my record was. I'm gonna predict it was still high. Let's go with like let's go with 60%. You give me too much credit. Uh, five and four. <laughs> okay. I, I also ran into, um, what is it? The st what is the? Oh God, I'm I'm suddenly missing it. Reckless Storm Seeker. I ran into Reckless Storm Ooh. Seeker on the play in three of those games, and yeah, that's pretty it brutal. was oh, it was brutal. It was not yeah. pretty. So I think I was kind of low rolling. I, mm -hmm. I was low rolling a lot, for, both to be on the draw that much, and I 
just getting a positive record off of like what I ran into is like, okay, that it's pretty strong deck. It's a pretty strong deck. And I was prepared to say it couldn't win on the draw because you cut Skyclave Apparition, you cut Brutal Cathar. That's how they cleaned up the three drop spot to allow for Maul the Skyclaves, Adeline, Redane, and Spellbinder. Just basically focusing yeah. on tempo and saying, we're not going to try to win an attrition match, though they do put those in the sideboard. We're not going to try to win a match with a lot of like creature that is also removal. We're just going to try to win with aggression. Um, it was better than I thought it would be. It was better than I thought it would be. The Fateful Absence is a real nod to the curve, right? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, it's just, there's a lot of things about this deck, which if you kind of look into it more, they're just quite clever. Um, the sideboard is also pretty sweet. Three copies of Guardian of Faith, I think really coming in clutch, um, especially against, you know, cards like Syndaclasm, for example. There are definitely, <clears throat> excuse me, there are curves against these Is it decks where like if you get out fast enough and then you're able to hold up uh, the Guardian of Faith, it's just going to be game, basically. So, um, you know, another swingy card, which can look fairly bad in some situations, but overall a pretty sweet inclusion there. Hey, Arjun. Um, hey, yeah. hey, hey, you're ambushed on the road. What do you do? <laughs> I, dude, I could not have told you before I just re read this card. Love to see all of these AFR draft chaff cards showing up in the sideboard here. So let's read this one. It's one white instant at common. Choose one, make a retreat, return target creature you control to its owner's hand, or stand and fight. Target creature gets plus one, plus three until end of turn. That stand and fight uh, looks pretty good in a meta with so much red-based removal. Um, this is probably going to blank pretty much any kind of like syndaclasmy, dragon's fire, any of that kind of nonsense. Um, so, and then of course, you know, being able to bounce your elite spellbinder, maybe, or just whichever of your most threatening creatures you have back to your hand. Yeah. Not bad. I'd say. I hate that. It says stand and fight, but you don't fight. Yeah, that's it, true. That makes me mad. <laughs> it's like stand and take it really. Yeah. It is stand and take it. <laughs> <laughs> Should say take it on the chin. You know? <laughs> Just, yeah just take it that that's what just the, take it, just take it. <laughs> <laughs> i love it <laughs> love it okay another card which i still just have a hard time exactly figuring out how it fits into the meta curse of silence so uh seeing some play in the sideboard here i'm not going to read this card because there's just too much text on it but it basically taxes your opponent and gives you a little card advantage uh, on certain spells i have not seen this card in play yet either in this tournament or on the arena. It was bizarre watching this deck sideboarding against an Epiphany deck because Curse of Silence stayed home. Um, yeah, that is weird. And I guess what you're saying when you do that is they're going to sideboard out Epiphany, which they did. Mm. So where where do you play it? <laughs> is it? Are you just keeping them honest? Are you just like, I put this in my sideboard so my opponent has to board the thing out so I don't have to board it in? Is it that five head or what? Or is it for some kind of a sweeper? I But they didn't sideboard it in for the matchup we watch. I don't know, man. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't have it. it. Is, I don't have the answer. It's odd. It is odd. I don't really know what to make of that either. Um, so, yeah, I guess we'll just have to watch the rest of the weekend and uh, see what happens. I'll save you some scrolling. The white decks are identical they are identical mm -hmm. yep okay so again these two players probably testing together so there we have mono white i think it's a totally reasonable deck if you've been enjoying mono white in the past uh, i'd say go ahead and craft this um i do think that this is definitely the main deck is tweaked for this meta yeah so if i was going to play this deck on the ladder i'd definitely be considering getting like some copies of apparition or brutal cathar in the main deck and yeah. probably making a few other tweaks you have to reconsider whether or not redain and spellbinder is where you want to be on ladder especially best of one ladder which is very creature focused yep exactly so you know i think there will be a number of people just kind of you know, running this main deck in best of one, and it's probably not optimized for best of one. So really do think about that. Watch CGB's videos and uh, put some more thought into it. It's pretty bad for control mages like me on best of one ladder, though, if everybody runs this version. 
that's true. I mean, if there's a lot of epiphany in best of one, maybe it's freaking the right choice, you know? Yeah. Uh, I, I do want to say quickly on the um, standard midweek data from competitive play going into this, Mono White did have positive matchups against Green and positive matchups against Turns, like really good matchups. Like, so yeah. that's probably why it was uh, the call. Yeah. Yeah, I think totally defensible choice. Be interested to see how it all shakes out. I will say, from watching today, we saw some pretty bad luck for these white decks. Um, so, you know, it's just a reminder that tournament results on everything. Uh, several games where the white deck could have easily crushed their opponent and just everything went wrong for them or right for their opponent, stuff like that. So just got to keep that in mind as well. Okay. Let's get into the main spice here. I'm sure the deck that CGB and I, and probably all of you are most interested to talk about. I'm just going to speak for you, CGB. Grixis Epiphany. What a list. I mean, I mean, is this list chef's kiss or what? You, I mean, CGB, you must have just like, you must have like settled into your chair with a little cup of hot whiskey to read this list. Huh? I mean, this is just something else. Uh, my reaction is on uh, on Twitch. Uh, Twitch subs can see it, or YouTube members can see it because I post those okay. for members. Uh, but yeah, I I did just start reading this, and my eyes just started falling out of my head. And then <laughs> a few, you know, scrolling down through the lists a few later, I read it again, and I was like, again, and then again, and then again. And this is the yeah. most played, uh, like card for card copy deck in the field at four copies. Uh, they're all four yeah. for four identical. So there are four people who feel like they broke it in a field of 16 that ran whatever this is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, first of all, Grixis being a quarter of the field in a standard tournament that let's just take that in for a moment. <laughs> so, okay. Part of this is that we have two leisure lands that they get to play in this deck. So, I mean, the mana has probably not been as good for Grixis in standard in a long, long, long time. So that's that's a pretty cool thing to note. Uh, apparently, you can play Grixis without a triome. Who knew? The deck does have an incredible amount of card selection. So, of course, that helps you to hit all of the land drops that you need. Uh, but I mean, and then of course, oh, okay, well, let's just get into it. Let's just get into it. Just okay. do it. Let's go. Okay. So first of all, running one copy of Smoldering Egg. It's a very interesting inclusion. Um, I think probably just a card that can be threatening and they're very happy to have one in pretty much any matchup. So, uh, that's, that's an, another interesting thing is it's one copy of the Smoldering Egg in the whole 75. And I'm just going to give it away a few crafties. There are no gold spend dragons in this list either. So the only other uh, creature that we see in the main deck here is not one, not two, but three, three copies of Leah, Disciple of the Drowned, which is a card that CGB has already gotten well known for playing. CGB, take yourself a little bow here. Because you figured out that this car was awesome before it was cool. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, this is busted, right? But nobody else is talking about it, and it, a lot of people like are eye rolling at it. And even though I've been playing the Lear decks on YouTube a lot, I've never played against somebody else running it. Maybe one other time I've run into a person running it. So I, I feel like nobody believes me. Is, is how it feels. And then we kind of yeah. Had it reinforced with a little a little spar on the podcast last week where I was excited to talk about Lear. Others were not. But I oh, it, I, I I think I was neutral, right? Yeah, you were pretty neutral. Michael J yeah. was like, what are you doing with that? He and was down on I'm, it. Man. But I get it. Like I had all the same feelings that he did. Like mm. that's exactly how I respond to a five mana, no protection, no flash uh creature in a control deck. I, I feel the exact same way. But there was something about this where it was like you could play for this inevitable end game where eventually this comes down and you play your graveyard because <laughs> all you need is yeah. for it to survive a turn. And when you have a card, um, Fading Hope, which is already a pretty good card on its own, it's hard to kill. 
because if the opponent spends their time in turn trying to kill it and you bounce it and then do it again, they're just back where they started. They've got to try again. Mm -hmm. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. A couple things to note about Leo. First of all, um, in the matchup in which you're truly concerned about Leo, it is like the control matchup here, right? And when you're playing like the Grixis versus Is It match, the games go long. You get lots of lands down. Uh, you get ample opportunity to find the perfect time to slip in your Leah. Next thing is that your opponent's probably boarding in like a number of cards like, oh, I don't know, Test of Talents against you, mm -hmm. or maybe some Negate. And so if you think about it, it's only Disdainful Stroke and Saw It Coming, which they might be likely to run that counter the Leah. And hey, you just don't always have one of those cards in your hand when your opponent goes to slam it, especially when you've been fighting over other important cards like Oren's Epiphany and stuff. So um, I, I definitely don't like the initial read of people being like, oh, it's going to be impossible to resolve your Leah. Eh. Have, eh, have they read Malevolent Hermit? There's four of those in this sideboard. Exactly, right? And Hermit protects this coming down on both sides. And then one of the sweet things about Leah is that oftentimes you only need to cast like one one mana spell from your graveyard with it to already start getting your money from it. So like a duress. Um, like a duress. Feels oh, good. Oh baby, which this list does run. So let's keep going down the list. You'll start to understand why Leah is so cool in this list. So this is an Alrin's Epiphany uh, Galvanic combo deck. So it runs four copies of Alrin's Epiphany and it runs two copies of Galvanic Iteration. So not leaning into that combo super hard, but it is there. Um, and then we have one main deck copy of Burn Down the House, four Expressive Iteration, two Duress main deck, one Blood Chief's Thirst. Okay, now let's get to the next overlooked, spicy, and absolutely fascinating card in this list. Three copies of the Celestis. Now, okay, did you see this one coming, CGB? I saw that other people liked the Celestis and I just didn't get it. The very mm -hmm. first time I actually put it on the battlefield, I got it right away. I was like, oh, I have read this card so many times during previous season and since it came out, I never realized that it's like a, a static ability that it says whenever it becomes day or whenever day becomes night or night becomes day, you gain one life and you draw a card and discard a card. I thought that you had to tap the three mana and tap it to get that effect. You don't. Yeah. It's just there. Yeah. So if a turn passes and nobody did anything, you draw a discard and gain a life. If a turn passes and the person whose turn it is cast two spells and they didn't do anything or... I'm sorry, but you know what I mean. Like yep. it, it flips yep. back and, and, and you can, it's kind of impressive that the three mana tap ability is a draw to discard to. It's like a piece of a Prismari command. You don't realize it, but if on your turn you do three and a tap it as a sorcery speed, you like, it, it becomes day or it becomes night. Like that triggers it, you know? So you get yeah. to draw a discard, but if you don't play you any don't spells play any and spells. you pass your turn, you do it again. Yep. yep yeah it's sweet and then of course you know the other thing to note is that once you've played the first one you can pitch your next copies of it to the celestis so it kind of solves that problem as well and the final thing to note is that when you're running a deck with a bunch of one drop spells so we've got two duress one blood chief's thirst we've got freaking um four copies of fading hope we've even got some spike field hazards and stuff so this deck has plenty of ways to slam the celestis and immediately cast a spell out of it um it's just freaking sweet man so again just like such a such a masterpiece of deck building i mean this deck is just so cool really all right is. so let's go let's go through the rest of the spells uh two spike field hazards three memory deluge one prismari command one demon bolt Four Fading Hopes, as I said, two Galvanic Iterations, two Juari Disruptions, one Cathartic Pyre, one Syndaclasm, one Power Word Kill. So, I mean, a spicy list with a bunch of one-offs, um, definitely kind of built for a diverse metagame. One of the things that I love about it is that you can pitch the cards that you are bad in the matchup to your Celestis, for example. You can also just put them back in the deck with Expressive Iteration. So basically you have to get pretty unlucky and draw a lot of your bad cards in the matchup to really get on the wrong side of this list. And it just has so many ways to hedge against that built in. 
So it's really cool. Um, and then it's, it's running 23 lands, just a nice selection of pathways and leisure lands for you. Um, and then the sideboard, we have four copies of Malevolent Hermit. This is just shaping up to be one of the most important cards in the format. Uh, one Unexpected Windfall, which uh, just an interesting, again, one of there. Two Mind Flayers, three, count them three, Cyclone Summoners. That's for that mono green matchup that everyone's expecting. Another card, which we watched do great work today, two copies of Go Blank. Yeah. So this especially, this especially supplements uh, the duress. And CGB, when someone Galvanic Iterations and then goes blank you, especially Ooh. in the control matchup, how do you feel about that? That's, you'll, you'll have to ask was it andre strosky yeah it was <laughs> yeah <laughs> yep he uh yeah andre did not win that game no nope. and uh yep it's it's pretty nasty go blank is just i remember you pointing this out cgb as being probably the best um the best mind rot ever printed and with all of these flashback cards and especially with lear in the format Man, a go even just having one go blank resolve against you can be so brutal. The interesting thing about the two go blanks in this sideboard, these players are aware as testing together and working on a deck together that they are 25% of the field. If they all choose this deck, like the best card against it is go blank. And they true. kind of all <laughs> actually it, it's kind of beautiful in a way, right? Yeah. They respected each other and all ran the same list so they all had two of them and nobody like tried to slip in that third you know nobody did that it's yeah it's kind of it's an interesting choice that both of course is good against epiphany i'm not saying they wouldn't run it anyway but the fact mm -hmm. that it's so good in the mirror and that they all stuck to two is kind of like i'm not saying it's giving me faith in humanity but it's trying <laughs> It's remarkable restraint, right? It is. So, yeah, I mean, you know, crafties, honestly, you just have to play with this list and see it in action to really appreciate how sweet of a bit of deck building it is. But it's just such a cool deck. And I've watched a bunch of streamers streaming with this deck, and it absolutely crushes. Something that it's easy to miss about this list, so I'm just going to highlight it for you now. The only counter spells in the 75 are uh, two copies of Zhuari Disruption. Unless you count it. the Hermit. I guess the Hermit. The Hermit sneaky. Does, the Hermit does count as spells, right? So that's it. And so they, this deck is intending to have Lyra in play, and that's it. They were like, we don't, we don't ever want to get caught in a situation where we get hosed by our own Lyra. Although we even did see that. Um, we saw Matt Sperling actually get boned out of... Uh, <laughs> you know, getting his Malevolent Hermit off because he had a Leer in play. So not that it would have necessarily swung that game, but it was interesting to see that interaction come up. Yeah. So this list is leaning in really hard on the, like, get down Leer and just try to disrupt my opponent's hand, just try to kind of do enough damage and get enough value that um, that's kind of the, the line that they've chosen to try to tackle other is it decks. Now, I'm curious, CGB... My impression looking at this list and then looking at the is it list that there are three copies of is that the is it list is still slightly favored in the matchup. What do you think about that? I think that's true. Um, it's kind of interesting. I, I keep on looking at it and I'm so used to the familiar way that these things play out, you know, um, the, the blue deck with counter spells versus the blue deck without it. Usually really bad for the deck without it. So they do have to get Leer resolved. There's a lot of things that I think need to go right. If they have Leer resolved, the counter spells won't hurt them. And then maybe they can do their combo of... Um, because remember, they're also an Epiphany iteration deck. So if they get Leer resolved, maybe they can do that. Hermit makes that really possible. They can also gut the opponent's hand with Go Blank and Duress. They need to line a lot of those things up in the post board games and make it happen. I'm kind of surprised. It makes me think that they believed that Green would run Epiphany down because this yeah. deck is very, very good against Green. 
Green yeah. does not have an easy time with Fading Hope or with Lear. And uh, there's, you know, all the one ofs, pretty much every single one of them is useful in some way against Green. So I think that they expected lots of Green, less Epiphanies. And in fact, kind of the opposite happened. Way more Epiphanies, half over half the field slightly, the tiniest bit over half the field, uh, and three mono greens. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that that is, I, I totally agree with you. Now, one of the reasons I think that Epiphany, uh, the Is It Epiphany lists are uh, pretty favored, I would say, in this particular matchup, is that they're running four copies of Unexpected Windfall. So why don't we pivot into talking about these Is It lists, because they're also pretty sweet. Um, so I'm going to read Andre Strasky's list at the end of day one. He was the only undefeated player in the tournament, just absolutely crushing it. So um, you'll recognize some of this list, but some of it is, is pretty cool. So in the main deck, Andre has uh, two Shatter Skull Smashings, three expressive iterations, choosing not to run the full four, which I think is surprising. Four Orange Epiphany, three Burn Down the House. So that's like a really coming ready for these aggro lists. And then in the instant slot, running one Spike Field Hazard, three Fading Hope, four Unexpected Windfall, four Unexpected Windfall, four Unexpected Windfall, very unexpected. Four Divide by Zero, two Memory Deluge, three Jawari Disruption, two Test of Talents in the main, two Demon Bolts, and four Galvanic Iterations, so the full four copies of Iteration, which I also find quite, quite interesting. 23 lands, uh, and then all of the creature aggression stuff is in the sideboard, right? So we've got two gold spend dragons, three smoldering eggs, two malevolent hermits, which I that's another number I find interesting. Um, got a couple of learn board cards for your divide by zeros. So I think one of the reasons that I think that this deck is going to have an edge over the Grixis list is just that throwing in unexpected windfall with your galvanic iteration orange epiphany combo is so powerful i mean it's so powerful it's going to let you combo like one or even maybe two turns earlier than you otherwise would have it also helps you dig to find the missing part of your combo and uh cgb tell the people what happens when you copy unexpected windfall with galvanic iteration what happens what what happens? I call it a value gasm. Do you need more description? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Just imagine crafties drawing a lot of cards and making a lot of treasure. It's a lot. It's that's, a lot. That's all you need. So one of the things to remember is that you do not need to pitch the second card mm -hmm. when when you're doing this, right? So you pitch one card to the unexpected windfall, and then with the free copy that you get, or I guess you paid for it with the iteration, but with the copy you don't need to pitch a card. So it's basically uh, pitch one, draw three, and make four treasures. Pretty sweet. Very sweet. Oh, sorry. I guess it's pitch one, draw four, right? Pitch one, draw um, four, and make four mana. And then, and then make four treasures. So, I mean, it's just, it's just absolutely brutal. Like, if you're not able to pull off your combo next turn after doing that, you're probably extremely unlucky. Yeah. And we did actually get to see Andre Strasky basically pull this off, make a bunch of treasure, take a bunch of turns. It, it was, it's just filthy. And so I think any deck that gives you long enough to get this all lined up is just going to get completely buried by the combo in this deck. And so I think that this is like, it's probably about as hard as you can lean into this combo in standard right now. I think that this deck, unlike what we were talking about with the Grixis deck, which is built to take advantage of a field of green, I think that this deck is actually built to battle the mirror. I, I think yeah. that that's where it's most comfortable. So it shows that the Checkhouse team, uh, Sifkla and Strasky and Hushimbeth, they actually, three three players on this list, they actually expected uh, that is it would still be the most popular deck. And in a way it was, since the Epiphany, the Grixis deck is almost, is it? It has yeah, eight, is it -ish. eight black cards, I think, between sideboard and main, mm -hmm. only like four in the main deck. So yeah, it's. I think that this deck is the best position deck for the field because 
very few decks are fast enough to mess with it and its plan against those decks is a ramp strategy to combo not a control strategy whereas like the white decks and the green decks can just play cards that are more difficult to kill or protect their cards with cards like snakeskin veil or in the case of the blue white tempo deck that we're going to get to you know a, a few well-placed spectral adversaries well uh this list of is it epiphany is actually innovating and trying to just go over just go over the top of everything quicker with the unexpected windfall strategy something that i hadn't seen very much of on ladder um and i am excited like i think that most people if they were told is it epiphany was showing up would roll their eyes and tune out a bit and mm -hmm. i actually want to try this version because i do think there's actual innovation going on here and possibly a better version of the deck than anybody had uh, on ladder in the last few weeks mm -hmm. yeah i totally agree with that one of the things that i love about the windfall against decks like mono green for example is i think windfall highlights the fact that mono green really doesn't kill you that quickly especially if your mono green opponent's doing like the a seeker's chariot ran in seven kind of stuff and so you know this is like a deck which on turn four can like take a big hit you know maybe you take like six or eight points of damage from your opponent but then like you untap with six mana and you can maybe place you know have access to seven mana on that following turn right and all you need to do is stay alive until you can start popping off your you know Alrun's and galvanic combo right so there's just there's so many ways that this deck is able to like get the combo off quickly and interact with the opponent. I mean, uh, Fading Hope is like such a good card against Mono Green. They basically only have Snakeskin Veil to fight against it. You can even sometimes just main phase it if your Mono Green opponent's tapped out. They really can't afford to you know play off curve that much. So you'll find plenty of spots, especially when you have extra treasures lying around to get this off. So. I yeah I see this deck even having great game against mono green because you can just get to the combo so quickly you just make so much mana um, that I imagine there's a fair number of games where like you're not even going to worry about your mono green opponent's board you're just going to kill them faster than they can kill you a quote unquote combo I had never processed until I tried it was divide by zero and unexpected windfall so if you cast Divide by Zero on their best thing on turn three and just go fetch any piece of junk lesson that you never actually want to cast, you can discard it to the windfall. Perfect. Yeah, it, it's just that, it's that one free piece of digital cardboard that uh, makes the whole thing just feel like it's more seamless. Yeah, love it. Here's a question I have. Um, would you try to find space in this list for the Celestis, or do you think it just doesn't match the deck? Huh. I'm kind of curious, right? I'm curious, like, what what are the factors that make you decide to put the Celestis in your control deck? My last version of Is It before I saw this list and the Grixis list had one ver one copy of Spell Satchel and one copy of Celestis. Mm, okay. So I, I'm kind of on my way. Um, I don't know if this version, though, with Windfall on top of Celestis if it needs it, but maybe, yeah, I mean, there's. Be. I, I think you try it. I, I don't know if you mm -hmm. need Test of Talents 2x in a best of one or in an unfocused meta. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think you try it. Why not? It, this list has less one drops than the Grixis list, so that might be kind of a deciding factor, but I don't know. I've still seen the Celestis look very, very strong. I even... I even kind of wonder if maybe you want to run like one or more copies in the sideboard. No, it's because so I smooth feel like... with Demon Bolt too. Maybe oh, it's, it's so yeah. nice, right? And and here's the thing. If you're in a control mirror, the player with a Celestis has got to feel so much better than the player without, right? Yeah. So anyway, that's a card I'd be looking to try to work into this list as well. But yeah, I, I think that this list just looks like total butter to me. Um, if I was going to play like the straight up is it list, I would definitely just be trying to rock something like this. Um, it just seems so smart, so powerful, so consistent, and just the best copying Epiphany deck in the field. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, do we have to talk about the Is It Dragons list? Not much. I'm I'm gonna say really quickly that uh, Kisuki Sato has an Is It Epiphany list as well. Um, he's mm -hmm. the only person playing this version and it's got four smoldering eggs as the primary difference from pretty much everything else 
in the field and uh, just a lot of interesting numbers, a lot of one ofs, like one into the Royal and one mm-hmm. saw it coming, two burning hands in the main. So it's a very interesting take on the deck. It doesn't, mm. it, it has a one Prismari campus. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. It, it, it's a funky list. I'm, I don't, I don't like it nearly as much now that I've seen the windfall version but Mm -hmm. you never know who's Mm going to win the world championship. They all have an equal shot at winning all the games and getting there. And Smoldering Egg has proven to be a heck of a card. Um, All of us were pretty excited about it last week, and it did show up, although not in a very, I think, different way than we expected as a one of in a bunch of the Epiphany lists, as a sideboard card in the Is It Epiphany, and then as uh, four of in this one version of Is It Epiphany. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, okay, just briefly with Is It Dragons here, um, we have this list being run by Yuta Takahashi. It's got the full four gold spends and full four smoldering eggs in the main. It's playing four expressive iteration, only three Allerans Epiphany, which is interesting. And I believe it's not even running the, the Galvanic iteration, uh, which is an interesting yeah, choice. I, this is a I, traditional I, dragon list. Uh, more of what you would have expected to see like week one of the new format before people started copying epiphanies wouldn't i don't know man wouldn't you at least want to get like one or two in there just for the off chance that you make it happen my my playing with a bunch of the champ with a bunch of the decks from the championship including mono white including grixis there's Mm. actually not that many ways to kill just good old gold span dragon it's Mm. kind of surprising but mm. I'm actually having played with the decks and run into this type of deck, this four gold span version of Is It on ladder a good amount. I actually think this almost throwback version of Is It, which is probably worse against an open field, but it might just be better against this field. I'm actually, mm. uh, I'm actually suspicious that this could be a good choice. Mm. I mean, I do think that like. In in the is it head to head? I feel like Smoldering Egg is probably actually pretty good, right? Because it's a threat you can get down early. They have to spend basically the entire game trying to like deal with it somehow. Um, you know, if it gets bounced back to your hand, you can fairly easily fit it back into your curve, and it's a massive threat. I mean, even one Smoldering Egg that goes unanswered can just end the game very very quickly against your opponent. So yeah, I could definitely see it. I mean, this deck can end games very quickly and very decisively if your opponent doesn't have like a number of the right answers for you. And one of the things I do love, I think that we're really playing with this tension in the format right now where like a lot of the counter spells cannot counter creature spells, right? And so like if your opponent's boarding into a bunch of hermits against you and you just go like like one or two smoldering eggs into one or two goldspan dragons, you might just freaking smash your opponent's face into the pavement, right? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, they're like trying to test of talents you and you don't even freaking care, you know? You're like, my spell was just to turn on my smoldering egg. Like, counter all of my spells, it's fine. You're just going to die to my creatures. And that makes a lot more sense when you think about three epiphanies, right? If epiphany is the target of the format, you trim on that, but you go up on the creature threats that they might not be prepared for. Yeah, and then it puts your your opponent in this weird bind where, like, you know, they need to respect your Allrun's epiphanies, obviously, and your more powerful spells, so they want some counter magic, but then they need to respect your creatures, so then it puts this weird strain on the deck where they can't decide, like, how many hermits, how many counter spells, how many removal spells they want to run against you. It really kind of, you know, forces you into that, like, five-head, like, 5D chess sideboarding game of chicken with your opponent so yeah yeah pretty sweet and it sounds a little convoluted to people who don't play much best of three or haven't played it at a high level but that is where the best players get the tiny advantages that make magic a little better than just a luck game yep couldn't couldn't have said it more myself all right um before we head out here let's take a look at these couple of rogue deck lists here and just see if we can glean any useful information. So Jean-Emmanuel Depra brought this team of treasures list, which, uh, as you pointed out, CGB is basically just gruel splashing blue. Moist. 
<laughs> Moist gruel. Do I have to? You have to. Your accent <laughs> demands it. <laughs> Fine. A of all gruel, B of all moist, C of all a spicy list. So this is also a gold span dragon deck. Let's go through the creature suite. We've got four gold span dragons, four Magda Brazen Outlaw, three Moonvale Regents. We'll definitely come back to that one. Four Jaspira Sentinel, so definitely a Sentinel Magda list. Four Prosperous Innkeeper, two Reckless Storm Seeker. Then we have the full four Shards of Skull Smashings, full four Asika's Chariots, four Ranger Classes. No, count them zero copies of Ren and Seven. And we've also got three Dragon's Fire and two Negates. 22 lands, by the way. So really leaning on, like, you know, those Shards of Skull Smashings and the Jasper Sentinels and stuff to, to get all of your stuff cooking. So... This is a really interesting list, CGB. What do you make of this particular configuration? Basically saying, like, I don't care about Ren and Seven. I'm going to lean into more of, like, like this is this is a deck that has a dragon endgame, right? Oh, yeah. It's trying to be fast. It, it mm -hmm. acknowledges that speed is of the essence and that you may not get another turn after number five, so you got to make it count for sure. Mm -hmm. um the the negates are a great nod to that um they're really hard to play through if you have a dragon you can also cast them off eight pathways in the mana base or the 12 different ways to make treasures so not a lot of risk to putting the gate in the deck and you can go up to four counter spells with two disdainful strokes coming out of the sideboard so that epiphany doesn't happen to you it's it's clock mm -hmm. plus a little bit of disruption to get over the finish line it's also trying to be a little bit faster than the other mid-range decks instead of trying to be bigger which I, is a trap that the mid-range decks and green kind of counts in this way can fall into that leads them into getting beaten by epiphany a matchup that they should be able to win yeah yeah i i mean one of the things i like about lists like this is they can beat anyone like with a good draw you can just pound anyone's face into the pavement i mean as we highlighted on the cast uh in a previous episode the combination of sentinel magda and innkeeper can lead to some truly disgusting openings. You can have these games where like on turn two, you have like six permanents on the board and your opponent's just wondering like where everything went wrong. Um, so yeah, you can get some incredible velocity with this deck. I also think, I think I love the combination of Stormseeker and Moonvale Regent specifically. I think that Moonvale Regent is a little mopey when you just slam it down as a four drop. Um, especially, you know, in a deck like this, which runs other, you know, like for a Seeker's Chariot and for Goldspan Dragons. So it's it kind of like, it's a little bit heavy on the top end and you do have a bunch of mana acceleration. So that kind of helps to make up for it a bit. But I think that cards like Reckless Storm Seeker allowing Moonvale Regent to just like slam down as a 4-4 four, four Hasty Dragon, I think really add value to that card. Um, and yeah, I think there's just there's several things about this list. It's also like the best Dragon's Fire list in the tournament, right? You had highlighted that earlier, that a list playing a bunch of Regents and Goldspan Dragons, your Dragon's Fire is effectively almost always turned on, and it becomes a very good removal spell at that point. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot to like here. I'm still, I'm still a little skeptical of Moonvale Regent, just in the sense that like, when you're hitting like negates and like other like really like I, I just I think that there's still a fairly reasonable chance in a deck like this that like you play your regent and you still have like two or three hard hitting four and five drops left in your hand that you don't want to discard. I mean that's and a then, good problem. I I suppose like, I suppose it's a good regent problem. Regent isn't have. trying to solve that problem. Regent is trying to solve the I have no cards left in my hand problem, which this deck can run into because its mid game top decks aren't great. Magda, Sent uh, Sentinel, and Innkeeper for all their explosive potential are terrible mid game draws, and you have twelve of them. You're gonna do it a lot. Yeah, I just think that like Moonvale Regent has a pretty bad Fading Hope problem, and it has a pretty bad Blizzard Brawl problem. And it has a like just it has a number of problems, right? And I think that it's one of the reasons why I have always 
kind of theorized and I still somewhat maintain that Moonvale Regent is best when it's like the top end in your deck so that you can like slam it as one of the last cards in your hand and then immediately start chaining off. And I feel like you're just not really going to get to do that very often in this deck. And, and it kind of makes me, it makes Moonvale Regent start looking to me like this kind of like thick, mid-range, somewhat slow, and not necessarily that card advantageous threat. So I'm still skeptical, basically. Understandable. I think it's going to be fine. I, I think that the amount of mana the deck produces makes it more likely that your Moonvale Regent is a all those things you said, but also draws a card or two the turn it comes down because you just cast anything else because you generated like 50 treasures. So I don't know. I, we'll see. Yeah, it's a hell of a top deck. And it's also a great way to cycle through like extra Sentinels and Magdas and all of this stuff that's not going to be very relevant in the late game. Mm -hmm. So there are definitely scenarios in which that card in particular can just kind of take you a distance and help you to hit like your next Goldspan Dragon or something. Yep. So really interested to see how this one ends up doing. Uh, finally, let's go to this Azorius Tempo list brought by Noriyuki Mori, probably the spiciest list. I don't know, this tied with Grixis for the spiciest list getting brought to this tournament. I have seen a number of people in this meta start to think about these kind of um, kind of blue tempo-y interacty lists in the meta game because, you know, they do, I think, present at least a plausible plan against these is it lists and these Allrun's Epiphany based lists while also being able to hopefully go toe to toe with some of the more aggressive decks. So, um, you know, we've seen like people like Crokeys, for example, has been doing a lot of experimentation with lists like this, or even like Bant party lists, stuff like that, uh, because you get to run this powerful card known as Concerted Defense, which uh, I think is quite well positioned in this meta game. Um, so again, we'll just remind you, Crafty's Concerted Defense is the one blue mana instant that counters target non-creature spell unless its controller plays one, plus an additional one for each creature in your party. So just like a nice kind of um, spell pierce kind of an effect that this deck gets access to, which can be absolutely backbreaking in the right circumstance. If your opponent manages to tag your like a Seeker's Chariot with it, I've done or your that. Sweeper, <laughs> or even, I mean, <laughs> let's say you're on the draw, right? And you just hit your opponent's Ranger class. Like, you got to feel pretty good about that, too. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, I mean, this card can be such a blowout, right? Um, and this this deck in general just has incredible blowout potential. Um, it's running Spectral Adversary. That's a great kind of flash thing that can really mess up your opponent. Let's go down the list. So we have four Luminarch Aspirant, four Elite Spellbinder, two Main Deck Malevolent Hermit, three Redain God of the Worthy, one Brutal Cathar, two Legion Angels. This deck's leaning quite heavily on Legion Angel. Um, one Loyal Warhound, it's an interesting inclusion, four Spectral Adversary, and four Intrepid Adversary. So the, the full eight suite of the adversaries in this deck. My mythic wild cards are Juna. <laughs> My mythic wild cards are hurting our Juna. Uh, suck it up. Suck it up, soldier. <laughs> we, we, we have a tournament to win here. Uh, one copy of Aaron's Epiphany, which is interesting. And then we have four Fading Hopes, two Juari Disruptions, one Fateful Absence. In the main, which is an interesting choice, and three concerted defense and 24 lands. So, including three Cave of the Frost Dragon, which actually ended up being quite relevant in the games that we watched with this deck. Um, I don't, it's hard to say why exactly it felt better in this particular deck, but it just seems, I think there's a lot of flying threats in this deck, like pretty big flying threats, and uh, Cave of the Frost Dragon just being threatening is like another additional way to push through. So choosing to run that instead of the whole snow package, which I just thought was an interesting choice that was made here. Um, so anyway, CGB, like we got to see this deck in action. I have to say that I felt like Noriyuka Mori got pretty unlucky playing this deck in the match that I watched. Um, looked pretty strong, like... It easily could have closed out this match against Mono Green. Uh, I don't know. What do, what do you think about this list? My time playing this deck, I have destroyed Mono Green. 
Yeah. Yeah. And when they had really good hands too. But I'm not playing against the best players in the world. So there might be something yeah. to it. Um, in my battles against Mono Green, they walked right into Concerted Defense. They walked right into Fading Hope. Uh, Fading Hope on a fight spell is basically don't play Fading Hope in the Mono Green matchup until you're basically blowing up a fight spell. It, yeah. Like, it's so good. It, it's one yeah. mana, destroy target fight effect, and they have so much... They just can't race you at that point. It, mm -hmm. The blowout is so extreme. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, again, the best now that people have seen the list, they might play against it better. Um, mm -hmm. And what we saw was some very impressive top decking from Sam Party running Mono Green. And yeah, I, I did feel like Maury's deck got a little unlucky. But the deck is trying to thread this needle, and it's trying to go like right between Mono Green, trying to race them with something that's hard to stop, which is flying attackers. And then it's also trying to keep Is It Epiphany off balance and beat that. And I think it's positioned well to do both of those things. I love that it's a rogue deck. I do think it takes the most splash damage. Anybody who played with and tested against this after it was leaked early probably has a much better sense for its capabilities. Spectral yeah. Adversary yeah. especially is a weird card to play around. Uh, also blows up fight effects very well. I will say this, to Deserted Beach, I had a lot of problems with not having like double white or double blue on turn four for either kicking the advers either adversary. Like if I had a spectral adversary in my hand, I had three white and one blue. If I had an intrepid adversary in my hand, I had three blue and one white. It happened so many times. And the two Deserted Beach really throws me there, but it's tough because you want cave of the frost dragon because you need that evasive attacker but you also want blue mana for fateful abs uh, not fateful absence concerted defense and fading hope pretty early mm -hmm. it's it's a bind that the mana gets you in and i'm not sure what the perfect solution is but a mm -hmm. tap deserted beach at any point in the curve is pretty nasty for you yeah i feel like you know, Azarius aggro decks always struggle with this problem. I feel like you basically need fetch lands to really solve the problem. Um, and we're just not going to see that kind of stuff in standard. But yeah, just kind of getting the right mix of mana and getting your stuff out. And especially like being able to pay for your adversaries and all that kind of stuff. It does really stack up awkwardly. So it does not surprise me at all. And in fact, uh, you know, for me looking down this list, I feel like the main issue with this list is consistency, right? Just across the board. You need to have your good cards in the right spots. You're going to have matchups where like you need to draw more creatures and you draw your third copy of concerted defense and you feel like an idiot. Um, you're going to have your matchups where you need any copies of concerted defense at all to win the game and you just don't draw them and everything in between. So um, I do see that as like, you just really got to believe in the hearts of the cards if you're going to play a deck like this and it'll have those kind of, explosive games you know those kind of croakies games i like to call them right where like you just you clutch it out of nowhere or you just go on an unstoppable run with the deck and you're like oh my god this is the best deck in standard and then you're gonna you know have these matches where like your deck just gets decisively crushed and you are never in it so i don't know it's just a very very swingy deck i think i agree i think that it's also got some issues, right? It's trying to be a tempo deck that can lean aggressive, and it especially needs to against decks like white and green because those decks hit hard. It has the the one drops are non-existent, and the two drops are ninety nine percent. They're they're like really mopey unless you yeah. get like a luminarch aspirant down, and that's never that great on turn you know two. It's good going forward so if it doesn't get removed it's fine but the rest of the time you're playing a 2-1 flash flyer you're playing a 3-1 lifelink on the ground it's it's rough it needs yeah. a lot to go right but it's a brave choice and it might be good because i like i said at least for ladder i'm smashing green pretty decisively yeah i think like especially in best of one you're just gonna get some people so hard with this deck and uh you know you can again it's just like one of those decks that can probably win against anyone in a good game. So, but it's no mono blue tempo. Like that's that's what I compare this to. You know, that that was a deck of previous standards which was so consistent. It had such a strong game plan. It had such a strong like aggro slash counter spell backup plan. 
So this is a much, it's a yeah, much less consistent version of a deck like that, which is aiming to do a somewhat similar thing. Um, so uh, yeah, anyway, you got to believe in the hearts of the cards if you're going to play this deck, Crafties. Okay, well, that's that's a rundown of the whole Worlds thing. By the time you listen to this, Worlds will already be over and we will have, as a community, collectively digested some of the outcomes of the tournament. But I think that um, this field is certainly spicier than I was expecting. Yes. And uh, I'm I'm excited. Like, I... I it's been a long time since I have watched as much magic on my computer and felt this motivated to watch the remainder of the tournament as well. I'm pretty much going to be glued to my screen the whole weekend. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm stoked. What about you CGB? I mean, I'm doing the watch party. I better get stoked. <laughs> yeah. Right. So you have a vested interest in it being interesting magic. No, it's exciting. Today was the first day of worlds. Um, it had limited, so I, I even skipped like round one because I'm yeah, lazy. Yeah, you got to take a nap. I great. took a nap. And I had, at one, I, I think I peaked out really close to 2,000 people just hanging out watching Worlds coverage uh, with me, which is yeah. already more than I've ever had at a watch party before. And it's just day one. And we've only done two rounds of standard. So I guess I better go yeah. get some sleep and get some tea for my throat and get ready to go again tomorrow. Indeed. Indeed. So, crafties, uh, go back in time and watch that with Covert Go Blue. All right. Thanks so much for joining us for another week of the Arena Craft Podcast. You can find us on Spotify and all of the usual places that you find podcasts, such as iTunes. You can find us on Google Podcasts. You can watch this on Covert Go Blue's YouTube channel. You can also watch both Covert Go Blue and myself stream on Twitch. He's at Covert Go Blue. I'm at Arena Craft Podcast. And uh, you can follow us both on Twitter if you want to do things like stay up on deck lists and, you know, find out what other cool people in the magic sphere are doing as well. I get so every pretty much every single episode of this that goes live, I see someone in the comments asking for deck lists. So crafties, if you want the deck lists, follow on Twitter. It's one of the one of the places we most consistently post that kind of stuff. I mean, you, uh, CGB usually posts his deck list with his videos. But if you want my deck lists, follow me on Twitter. Basically, any deck list worth playing, I'm going to put it up on there with my thoughts and screenshots and all that kind of good stuff. So you can go there. Um, also, thanks to our patrons for keeping the lights on, keeping us motivated, keeping our editors in business. Uh, really, really helps to support the show. So if you've been enjoying the show for a while and you want to just give us a little bit, you can get in for this low, low price of three US dollars a month. It's basically like cheaper than a Starbucks latte. And, uh, you know, it's a tasty latte. It's really tasty. Yeah. 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 Ho spicy. Hopefully our content is worth that to you. Right. <laughs> so uh, anyway. All right. CGB, uh, go rest up. And I will look forward to seeing more of you tomorrow. Later, crafties.